and Betty Forrest, John's mother. And uh, he was raised here most of his life. Now he lives in a big house on the hill, and I wonder how he ever made it through all the fire and the brimstone. Now you can talk some talk. <laughs> Diamond T Sports presents the story of one of racing's greatest heroes, John Forbes. Hi, I'm Steve Evans, also known as Straight Man to John Forbes, the winningest funny car driver in NHRA history. But that's a role I don't mind playing one bit, because in these days of corporate correctness, it's nice to have a race car driver who still says what he thinks. In John's case, sometimes he says it before he thinks. But that is part of the Force charm. It is his candor, his bravado, and his humor that have made John one of the most popular personalities we have today in motorsports. It's been a long, bumpy, and sometimes fiery journey for John from that trailer house to the big house on the hill, but with a lot of laugh stops along the way. And now that he's made it, John will be quick to tell you, for many seasons to come, he plans to be still the one. No doubt, for John Force, one of the biggest attractions of funny car racing is its gypsy lifestyle. Like a rock and roll band playing the big stadiums, 19 NHRA national events a year. And then the small clubs, up to 35 more match races and special appearances on the off weekends. The youngest of five children, John, stricken with polio at age two, literally grew up on the road. Living in wagons, trailers, and motorhomes, the family following his truck driving father up and down the Pacific coast. By the time John was in his teens, his family had settled down, living in a trailer in Downey. Today, it's a reminder to John of humbler times. It's just a fascination to look back 30 years and see where it all started. Longer than 30 years, going back, geez, almost 40 years with me. The most memorable moment of your father, just right off the top of your head. He used to get me, I think one of the biggest treats that we had was on Thursday nights, I'd come home from school and mom would say, Dad, Dad has a surprise for you. You're going with him to Phoenix. We go to John Wayne's ranch because he would haul cattle back and forth there in these big trucks. And that was it. We would get out at 3 o'clock in the morning. We'd have our brown bags, and we'd load up our cartons of milk, and he'd have his coffee, and we'd get in that 18-wheeler, and we'd load up, and we'd head out the interstate. She said she was tough, wasn't she? I was tough. The truth is, yeah, I was tough. number one, Mom's the best cook ever was, oh, ever, okay? Oh, Mother, say that. And, uh, yeah. But that's a fact. But, but but mainly that if we had our ups and downs with dads, mom was the one that protected us. It was really kind of a unique yeah. deal. She slipped the money out the back door as a kid to get a dollar to go to the movies. What do you think, John? Do you take more after Betty I or your late dad? I could finagle him out of things. If I he'd think... come to me, to finagle him. Don't you love it? I do. I think that, uh, I think I was motivated like my dad. He was a real workaholic, you know? But I think that the gift to Gab come from my mom. A little bit happy days, a little bit rebel without a clue. John Forrest in high school split his time between a team's typical obsessions, football and cars. Now maybe not the best athlete, maybe not the best mechanic, he still pursued both with a passion. Yeah, he got me into sports. Well, I go clear back to, to grade school when the other kids were playing flag football in Oregon. I hitchhiked 50 miles to play Pop Warner football. I, the real deal was kind of an ego thing, wearing a helmet, shoulder pads, and looking like the guys on TV playing pro ball, and it seemed like I've been wearing a helmet ever since. What was your high school record as a quarterback? Oh, terrible. Terrible. How terrible? 20, three seasons, nine games a season, 27 losses at Bell Gardens High. We hold the record. When did John have his first car? Was he old enough to drive? Tell me the truth. No. My first actual uh, vehicle was a Cushman motorcycle that my dad bought me and I was up and down the streets continually with it. 
and then right into an automobile. I mean, it's been motorcycles and cars for as long as I can remember. They were more of a home to me than actually the trailer house. That's where you carried your uniform, your football uniform, and that's where you carried your school book. True story, three speed on the car, went out, took it apart. Me and my, me and my brother Louie had a, got a three speed shifter to put in the floor, cut the hole in the floorboard, stuck it in. We were pumped. I remember walking up on the railroad tracks behind the trailer and standing there and it was like victory. And I slung that gear shift down the street because my, my days of driving a shift on the column, like none of the big guys did that. And about the next day, my dad walked in and I was sleeping on the couch and he said, I need to use John's car. And man, I knew he was coming back through the door because he went out there and there was, he reached up and there was no gear shift. Betty, your son is a five-time world champion driver. What kind of a teenage driver was he? Well, I'd say he's a lousy driver because uh, he came up before the examiner before he was 18, and they had a bunch of tickets on file. How many tickets? I think it was like 21 or 22 tickets before I was 18 because I was in a car that it had broken windshields, no headlights, but it was my, it was my hot rod, you know? And anyway, they, uh, the guy called me in there, and he said, Bill and I, and he says, I want you, your father, you to explain, your son to explain to you what each one of these tickets did, the worst ones, you know. And he had an explanation all of, uh, for everything he, he had. He had an explanation for it. And he looked at me, he said, well, you know what I'm going to do? He says, uh, I'm going to give you back your license. He oh. said, they're going to wonder in Sacramento who's the nut around here, you or me. In 1982 and 83, operating on a budget one-tenth of the major competitors, Austin Coyle wrenched a then-unknown Canadian driver, Frank Hawley, to two Winston World Championships. In 1984, Coyle folded his team and went to work with force. I remember watching a video. It was the coverage of a race at Gainesville. Don't remember exactly what year, but there were a couple of fires there during qualifying or early on in the race. And in the beginning of the coverage, they showed that. And the first one was Tim Gross. And you know he'd had a pretty good fire. And on the other end, the car's burning. He jumps out the escape hatch and actually you know, dives for the ground, lands on his hands, does a somersault, and ends up on his feet standing there saying, I'm OK. And then Force had a similar situation where he's on fire and sideways. And as he's getting stopped, the cameras are right there. He jumps out the escape hatch, rolls off the side, and ends up doing a belly flop right on the concrete. <laughs> You got to admit, and Evans, will, Evans will, will, will back me on this. I'm the only one that ever jumped out of a burning car, went to the cameras, and Evans says, cut, there's no tape. And I jumped back in the car, on fire, <laughs> to and come back out the roof a second time, just so they could get it. Austin, it's 1984. Life is good. You've won two Winston championships with your own Chi-Town hustler and Frank Hawley. Uh, and John Force, a non-winner, approaches you. What happened? Well, you know, it came at a time to where Frank had decided he was going to quit from the driving seat, and we didn't have the sponsor support that, that we hoped we'd have to continue on into the next season, and we were really kind of thinking that, you know, it is going to be really tough to keep up an NHRA campaign at this point. And uh, John essentially gave me a call and pretty much made an offer to me I couldn't refuse. It uh, probably took a couple of weeks for us to get together on a deal, but... Uh, it kind of happened that way. When you've got Austin, you've got an opportunity to win. Yeah, Austin could have gone anywhere. Mm -hmm. He could have worked for anybody. Or stayed on his own. On his own. He was doing fine. you got a guy that has that kind of talent. He's a real, he's not just a crew chief. He's an innovator. He creates dinos. He, he creates things in his head. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And uh, he could be an alien baby. It's possible. What does that mean? He's, he's a, a special breed, and yet, and, and can't hardly get along with anybody. You know what I'm saying? But we get along because I pay the bills. I've listened to him as a coach. He taught me how to drive. He put the long throttle in my car to teach me how to backpedal. He put the short throttle on quick tracks that no one understood, blocks of wood under my feet, how to control burnouts. You know, uh, he really taught me. Uh, God's truth, if it wasn't for Austin, I wouldn't be a world champ. Down at the far end of the racetracks, I have seen some horrific arguments between you and Forrest. Is that just like two brothers battling? And uh, it's more like husband and wife. It's like you, you know, you know, something's on your mind. You speak it right away, and you know, And at the moment that something goes wrong, I think it's natural for both of us to feel like we ain't taking the blame for this one.
John Boers making his first final round appearance of the year is squaring off against 89 Winston champ Bruce Larson. John Boers racing Richard Hartman is appearing in only his second ever Cajun Nationals final. You want in a whole shot, even sweeter. A whole shot, I can't believe it. I thought I was late. I can't hardly talk, it's those brazens again. <coughs> I thought I was late. You weren't late. What was the times? 45 to a 44. 45 to a 40? He ran quicker? Yeah. <laughs> cool, where's he at? Our driver pulled this one out for us, winning with a slower ET. I'm sure that'll make him happier than it makes me. Oh, it's gonna be fun tonight with Cole. I finally did something right. That's what I'm saying. John Force looking for his third straight win of the year could take the Winston points lead away from Ed McCulloch with a win right here over Mark Oswald. Fine job, but how about this guy? You guys fight a lot, but you can't today. This guy's the best there is, but I'm tired of telling him his head gets too big. <laughs> is that true, John? Hey, fight a lot. You should have been there first round to get Dinsham. Yesterday we had the big Duke out and Coyle quit on the start line. I said, you can't quit me. You ain't even paid yet. <laughs> Already the number one qualifier, John Force, is looking to improve on his earlier 533 pass. McCullough and I watched Larson and I watched Spurlock and hey McCullough we ain't dead not yet but I tell you something I watched them boys burn and get into the wall and I just I kept trying to get her straight and get her straight and the flames were getting hot and I said that's enough of this shit I'm disabandoning the ship and I hate to jump from a car that's moving but sorry gang I'm glad I was on a single because I could have got somebody in trouble but it got too hot to stay and I run out of air and and uh I'm glad we got a spare body, uh, no burns here. The only thing hurt was when I hit the ground moving. My shoulder, it was like a football game, kind of exciting. Here they are, number one and two in the Winston points. John Force looking for season win number six, and McCulloch trying for number three. I've seen sicker dogs get well, but not very many, and not this well, John. Well, I haven't got all the news. Uh, uh, the sponsors, Castrol, Jolly Rancher, Oldsmobile, for giving us a great race car, Easy Wider, the Wax Shop. All these people are important. Uh, I did a good job driving the day, but what I want to say is, you guys, come here. This is the hardest bunch of troopers I've ever had. We burnt the car up. We built the fuel tanks up. We did everything you could do to bring it back. A motor every round. And this is the best group, led by Austin Coyle, Bob Fisher, Butterfield, Harmson, Finn, and my newest, Stan Finn, my newest guy here, Morgan. And uh, these guys are great, because you know what? It was almost over down there. Everybody was beat. And I just didn't think they could hang on much longer. I was sleeping in the lounge. I got to tell you the truth, I was beat. You did a good job. I thank all of you guys. You did too, man. Job. 
There's $50,000 on the line in the Big Bud Shootout as John Force, the 87 winner, and Bruce Larson, the 89 Winston champ, in the finals of this special race within a race. John Forrest crawls out of a blazing inferno to celebrate winning the Big Bud Shootout with John Gardella, one of the people that have been behind this team. Forrest. Did I keep it off the fence? You might have just bent 50 to win 50. Was that good or what? Yeah. Okay. I only bumped the guardrail once. It's okay. You're, you're okay, man. I used the fire bottles. Good drive. All right. You got him this time. And I had my foot out when she blew. Tell him to do the same thing. John, you've been living with this threat of fire every run for two races. Exciting, man. Prior to this year, John Force had won only five races in 11 years. Here in 1990, he's already won six races in six final round appearances. Can he make it seven for seven? Give me some love over here, huh, buddy? One thing we never tire of is listening to John Ford. He didn't. I do. Yeah. Piece of cake. Say a few words to this man. You have all you. <laughs> hey, it looks like our problems are solved and like we're on the road to finish this championship off, so it looks like to me. John Force, having already tied Don Brudome and Kenny Bernstein's single season win record, is hoping to make his eighth final round of the season by getting past Mark Oswald. the throat and you ain't got time to think whether you're gonna blow up and catch on fire just try to chase that old boy down and bang boom nice bank deposit one hundred fifty thousand dollars well yeah i think at the bank but i'm gonna have to back out the back door just to get away because that creditor line's gonna look like the the gates out front here tomorrow we laugh about it but i can only say one thing i give great thanks to the good lord that john force is here is well is happy and is prepared to receive the honors accolades and cash awards that go with being a Winston champion. John, it's your turn. Thank you. <laughs> he started going on the drag races with relatives who were involved. Yeah, the Beaver Brothers and Condits, they yeah, go way back. to the strip. Yeah, you know, strikes. His dad used to come, which he is going out. John's coming in in the morning. Were you instantly attracted to it when you went? Well, yeah, he saw the numbers on the car. It was just the most exciting place to be, Lions and Irwindale, and that's when Perdome and McEwen and the guys were beating up and down the racetracks, and it was like, you just stood out there and dreamed of that, and I mean, the first car I started with was really hopeless, but to me, it was a beauty, and uh, no, you never imagined it. It just happened. When he left school, what did you think he'd do? What did you think your son's future would be? I had no idea what he would ever do. John was just, he was just there, you know? We never amount to anything is what she's trying to say. <laughs> you kind of followed your father into the world of big rig trucks. Well, I really oh, did. He always had big rig trucks. We always enjoyed the machinery and big rigs like that. Kind of a fascination with and that. And a cowboy kind of thing. Highway, yeah. romance yeah. of the road, my dad called it. And uh, I enjoyed it. And that was where I spent five or six years trucking up and down the interstate. Did you ever own your own truck? No, never did. Well, I do now, my racing rig. Let's talk about your first race car. First race car, uh, uh, I mean, I had lots of cars. My brother and Louie and I had a car every weekend, old Chevrolets that we raced and Henry J's, and uh, we met a dragster one time. No one ever thought I was ever in a dragster, Steve, but we had one with an Oldsmobile motor in it injected. It was the old Albertsons Olds car, a real sure. old one. Made one lap at Lions, seized the motor up, set it on fire. 
That's when I learned about clearances and the bearings. I never knew they existed. But that was the end of that. That was one career shortened right there. Then you had a little kind of a fuel altered like car. I did. I took it to Lions. Couldn't get down the racetrack. Didn't have a license. Didn't have a clue what I was doing. But I was out there. Perdome and the big guys, they were running. Gartlets and just the thought of being there was something. And uh, we actually took it home on Sunday and thought, let's find out how this thing really works. And that's when I got in trouble. The throttle stuck and it was end over end into the side of a guy's house. And another career shortened. You bought your first money car, and how you funded that is kind of interesting. Well, my cousins, the Beaver Brothers and Condits, Dave Condit drove funny yeah. cars. Uh, uh, they were racing, and we were, I was just in heat all the time at the races. Every time I could, that's what it was all about. Dr driving my truck, reading National Dragsters. Actually, it was the old, wasn't National Dragster back in them days? Drag News. Drag News. And reading that and just dreaming about the deal, and I had a $1,200 uh, check from the government, and uh, my wife had gone on let's make a deal and won the big deal and she won an organ and uh, uh and a number of things and i we traded that and the uh, uh the, the check to beaver the car was in australia at the time which was a real surprise wait a minute hold it you bought a car and didn't know it was in australia well, the car was in australia what they didn't tell me that was down in the outback that it came off the trailer and zebras and lions ate it you were in a car at orange county one night uh when beaver brought the car back from australia and it was it was really beat up pretty bad and we we recovered uh, put it together that's when I met Don Steves at Tom Steve Chevrolet mm -hmm. and uh, put that little program together and uh, headed for Australia but the, the real funny story was the picture that they used because they didn't know anybody down there at that time right. they were 15 years behind us and they wanted American stars but to sell the promoter uh, uh, Don Harding down under in, in Sydney Australia he took a photograph in fact we came to you you were running uh, or Orange County yeah. Raceway at the time you wouldn't let me run 64 funny cars, but you allowed me to start my car and push it out on the start line next to uh, Mickey Thompson. And that was your press picture for Australia? That was it. Went to Australia. It was on every billboard, every sign, every pub. And I was an instant hero because they saw Mickey Thompson. Didn't know who John Force was, but if he raced Mickey Thompson, he had to be great. And you did pretty good. You really did. Pure, pure insanity, pure luck. We actually, the very first day they wanted somebody to do the, the media day, and they went in front of the press, and I thought, press, somebody wants to see me in a race car. And I was scared to death. I got in it, because I'd never done a, a burnout with the car. Gary Denton was there and actually said, let Force go ahead and spend his money. We did a burnout, kicked the rods out, and that was on Thursday afternoon, set it on fire, just for a film. And these, these Aussies thought, this guy is really OK here. And we came back, put a motor in the next night. Uh, first run, uh, couldn't get it in reverse. Second run, ended up on the grass. I didn't have guardrails. I was running over to spectators and picnic lunches. And the third run, and I don't even know, and you can ask Gary Dencham, God's true. It went right down the avenue, throttle stuck, went out the back door, went out in a, a field, caught on fire. That's when it all started. And I remember a cow looking in the window at me. He just walked up and looked in the window because they opened the gates to the cow field. But it was over. Career was over. We were out of motors. We were broke. Went to the whole room. And next week, a big old guy showed up named Stomper with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I said, I had to have some American food. And he walked in and he said, newspaper, you're the new star, the first guy to ever run over 200 in Australia. And I was a national record holder, and that's what kept me alive. Back in the States following his Australian tour, John took to the road, begging and a-borrowing to fund his quest for racing adventure. John, when you first started racing, buddy, it was lean out there. And mom and pop, uh, they came to the rescue more than once. I really give credit to mom and dad, especially mom convincing dad that I'd pay those credit cards back. She would slip the credit card out the back door to send me to the next race town if dad and I were arguing over it. But you know what was really funny? When she was slipping it out one door, dad was sneaking around the front, leaving it on the windshield wiper. <laughs> And he didn't want to tell her, and she didn't want to tell him. So it was one of them deals where I really didn't want to tell him what was going on to hurt either one. I just took both cards. Speaking of credit cards, there was a period when the only thing you had was a Union Oil credit card, so you lived in a Union Oil truck stop. See, money gets spent, but a gas card went on forever. We were at a race at, at Columbus, Ohio, and right in the middle of the heat of battle, we crashed the car, and we were beating it back together, and Bob Harmson was the president of Jolly Rancher Candy, and he was out there helping us fiberglass the car, and the old man ran out of gas. Well, it ran off the truck. And he said, what happened? I said, well, we're over. He said, well, never again. You'll have a credit card. And I've had one every since. But he didn't know you were going to put food on it, showers, music, cassettes. I mean, whatever they sold at the Union 76. <clears throat> I can tell you things unique. 
One night in Union 76 in Denver, we went in, and we all wanted eggs, and the guy came in and said, you cannot order food on a gas card. I said, we're starving. You've got to do something. The guy says, well, there's got to be a way to do this. And he brought us one egg this long. It was that big around, and it was that long, because that's how they make eggs in truck stops, and they chop them, yeah. right? He gave us one egg, and that was the joke. This is what you get. We had no money. We were coming down from Seattle. We had about 80 cents, and I went into a store, and I bought some slices of bread, and I told the guy, I want six slices of bologna, and I've got this much money. So he took it out, and he cut it too thick. And one guy was short a slice, and the fist fight started. Tell us about the early days when you were backing that car up and mixing fuel and uh, really a part of the race team. Well, I was part of the team because I was free, and nobody was paid back then, so whoever would volunteer uh, got the job. And um, I helped um, pack the parachutes and back the car up, mix the fuel. Nothing really hard, but... Um, it, I still got in there and got a little greasy. Did you enjoy it or detest it? Yes, I did like it. It was exciting. Um, it was scary, really scary back then because um, he wouldn't even get to the other end. Something would happen to the car. Um, he, he wasn't a very good racer and he didn't have very good parts. And uh, so it, it was a whole a whole nother race than, than it is now. Well, the first time I saw John in action actually was uh, up in uh, uh, Woodburn, Oregon. And we were up there. I was with a dragster from uh, Edmond, Alberta, Wheeler Dealer car with Terry Cap and Wes Van Dusen. And I remember looking at John's act and saying, man, I don't know if this guy's got a future in the sport. Things look pretty tough over there. You met us at, at, at Woodburn. Mm -hmm. Steve Pluger was running my car. Mm -hmm. We ended up back. We kicked the rods out on every run. We ended up back in the hotel, and we put the, it was so cold out that we put the motor in the living room and rebuilt it, and we slept around the engine. And the next day at the racetrack, when the race was over, the track promoter came over and said, he oiled our track three times. They're suing us for the hotel rooms they ruined. And then after he left the start line, and we said, God, he got to the other end with the chutes out, and he didn't ruin the track again. What else could go wrong? Well, my wife, Lori, took the crew cab and ran over their Christmas tree on his start line. Totally wiped the guy out. He said, I've never been back. Nineteen ninety was a dream year for John Morris and crew chief Austin Coyle, and it appears they're starting ninety-one like they ended ninety. Morse matched against Glenn Micras here looking for his first Winter Nationals win. No, didn't know it. I couldn't see. Oh, really? And I'm looking for cones, and I'm counting cones, and I thought, man, I could be five miles. I'm going in a ball of fire. So I jerked my foot out of it, and I hit the chutes, and I saw the cones coming. I thought, oh, oh no. relight this, baby. <laughs> if he had drove around, we got to fix that. My butt's too big or something. i got to get down and see. Obviously determined to prove his 90 championship not a fluke, John Force has opened 91 with three straight final round appearances. Here against Ed McCulloch, he's looking for season win number two. He left with. I had a 490. That old man was right on my ass. He's a good Another old boy. 21. <laughs> yeah. Give me a back one. Two out of three. Here goes the negotiations again. Here's two men who've been around the sports for a long time, but they're now racing at opposite ends of the sponsorship spectrum. John Fors and Tom Hoover. John Forrest, what did you see through your windshield? I, that, sorry for him, but that was spectacular. 
my old heap of smoke in the tires. My daddy told me, don't ever give up on this hunk. And it was trucking. I thought, God, she's running out of guts. I'm throwing everything out. She's smoking the tires. Hoover's got me coming into the first light, and then his shit just went away. It went away. It was amazing. I mean, it was spectacular. The best seat in the house. Last season, John Force was the number one qualifier a record 10 times. Here in Montreal, he's hoping to improve right now on his number six spot. didn't hurt itself something exploded it like something weird we're back the competition is starting to close in on John Force he had an early season advantage but it's been whittled to under 500 points the pressures on crew chief Coyle and John to pull out a win here John Force has started referring to that rollingly all known Jim White driven Daytona as the Dodge from Hell. John would love to notch his second straight win and widen his lead in the Winston points. It looks to me like the driver saved you guys again. Well, that's what a driver's supposed to do. That's why them guys get all the glory and most of the money. John Force, the Winston points leader, comes to the line against Mark Oswald for Force, his third straight final round appearance. A third straight win will move him that much closer to championship number two. For his three in a row, congratulations. A great win here in Minnesota. We're excited, Steve. It's a chance maybe to win another world championship, and we just kind of keep trying to push that lead out there. In the days, some of the bad guys fell, and it's just, uh, it's just fate there. John Forrest, congratulations. You've done it for the second year, the Winston Funny Card Champion. It feels great. You know, uh, a lot of years went in, and you know, Billy Schultz, I drove for him years ago, he said this morning, you do it once, you're a flash in the pan, but he said, you do it twice, he said, you earned it. When I look back, and last year at this banquet, let me tell you, I caught hell from mom, because I forgot dad. I lost, <laughs> I lost dad a few years ago, but he was the guy that gave me the credit cards and kept saying, chase the snake and mongoose, and I kept chasing them. And uh, it was tough paying them credit cards back. And mom, I'm gonna finish it off this week. I know it's been 18 years. <laughs> Bernstein said, and he had a shirt on. I don't know if he said this, but he wore the shirt. He said, the guys with the most toys wins. Did you say that, Kenny? <laughs> well, my dad said to me, all that's left in the end is a graveyard. And he said, the guy with the most memories wins. And I have the most memories. I'm the world champ. I won. Every racer will tell you it takes two things to win, money and someone who knows how to spend it. A born hustler, John has always carried an impressive array of sponsors on his cars and has been tuned by some of the sport's best wrenches. You'd just camp in some guy's office until he helped you. You wouldn't go away? Wouldn't leave. You know, I used to stand outside and I used to look up into the sun, hold my eyes open until they got beat red, and then I would run in there with tears in my eyes and tell them how I did it for them. And it worked. By pure luck, I ran into a, a group called Leo Stereo, had a store chain, and they actually had a clown on the corner giving away balloons. Yep. And I went in, I said, what do you pay that clown? They said $300 a day to give away balloons, or for two days. And I said, well, I can give you a truck, trailer, and a race car, and me, and I can make anybody laugh. And that was really the beginning. Perdome used to come by a lot in those days and laugh a lot. Never bought a stereo, <laughs> but uh, it was too busy racing. But, th but that's really what it was about. I, I, and for the first, probably the first 10 years of my career, Steve, I wasn't really known as a drag racer. I was a guy that did displays. What about the Wendy's deal? There again, 
I was strictly doing displays. I opened 25 stores here in LA and Orange County, and that's all we did every week, and then we got to run off once every two months to a, to a race. Tell me about the Coca-Cola car. Was that really a big Coke deal? No, nope, never had a big deal. Faked it again. There was a deal when the local group uh, I got with uh, uh, Wiener Schnitzel, a hot dog chain in California, doing displays again, uh, stop and go markets. But uh, it was a lot of people that helped me. You'd have one place that'd give you a, a free shop, another place would give you free food, another place would give you soda pops, and that's kind of the way it was. But it was real tough. I, I can remember when Flash Gordon Minio drew his gun on me in the shop, repoing the motor, and I said, you gotta hang on one more weekend. Joe Paisano wanting to fist fight me in his shop one night over some rods that I owed money for. But I think they all really realized that, that they saw that I was an honest individual and I had a good story, but I meant well. And I, was, and I think they saw a lot of me and a lot of those guys, Paisano, Flash Gordon, we all came up through the ropes. You had some good crew chiefs, though. Bill Schultz, I mean, there was none better, really. Billy Schultz, Henry Velasco, Larry Frazier, Steve Pluger, my chassis builder today, was actually my first crew chief that ran my car for free. He was crazy, just learning to drive. Uh, he came a long way since then. But, I mean, we go down the road together in the truck, driving, tractor and trailer, driving together, and he'd just tell you stories all night long about creatures and dragons and all that. That was his thing. Keep you awake all night. When he sat up there and it was his turn to drive, he was too tired to drive because he'd been up with you all night. Bill, tell me the story about John Forrest and the port -a john Well, when we were first starting out, we were trying to figure out where to shift the car. The cars had transmission in those days, and as we looked around, John says, I don't know where 300 feet is on the track because that's where I want him to shift. And So I looked down the track and I saw there was an outhouse about 300 feet down the track. So I said, just shift at the outhouse, wind her by the and then shift, you know what I mean? So he worked out fine, he had good. He said, how'd I do? Great. He says, keep doing that. But the next day, I came back to the track, and uh, they had moved the outhouse to about 1,000 feet. Well, he didn't tell me, and I didn't notice, and he just went to 1,000 feet. We melted everything we had, but it, that's John for you, you know what I mean? The first time we raced was 1981, right? You came over to the house, and we decided to uh, put my motors in your car. Well, actually, Henry, I got a phone call that said you were looking for a very talented driver, and I was available at that time. You do remember. Oh, get real now. <laughs> see, see what he does? Every time. <laughs> We no, could. It's the truth. I mean, you were a, a no-driving son of a gun. Actually, I came from Amarillo, <laughs> Texas, from the Burn Center, okay? Uh -huh. And I knew, and everyone told me Henry's parked his top fuel car, and he's not going to run it. And the first thing I asked was, does he have motors? <laughs> Keith Black motors. They said, well, he's got Henry Velasco motors. And I said, I'm going to go see him. And I came in with my, my pitch. And it was a pitch. Uh, it was it was good times. I mean, we really enjoyed ourselves. I thought so. Anyway. Up till the fist fight. Never you overreacted. That. See, see you... now he wants to fight. <laughs> now he wants to no, fight. No, again, you overreacted. See? You thought that I was going to quit, and you grabbed me, and, I, and you, I, we started going like this. Right? I you loved know, him. I loved this guy. <laughs> I really did. We had a lot of fun. Oh, I mean, Henry right. was a guy that was racing, true, top fuel name. Everybody knew who you were. They still do. Okay. We were having some bad times. Remember, I caught you a fire a couple of times. We, and, oh, no, them were the good times. Oh, yes. I haven't had any good TV <laughs> since then. It's really hard to explain to people they don't realize that you can win races and get exposure, but catching on fire, you get it all. It's a red light for John Forrest. Mike Dunn goes up in smoke, and John Forrest explodes an engine just as he passes through the lights. You okay? Fine, Steve. Again, the safety equipment. <laughs> what we should do without Save it? Save my butt. What could you do? When we saw the white smoke, that's when the uh, fire bottles hit, I guess. Oh, yeah. Save me. I love it. When we raced for the championship back in 1991, our biggest opponent, without a doubt, was Bernie Federley, right here, and uh, Ed the Ace McCullough. They drove the Miller car for Larry Miner. And week after week, we fought on fire, upside down, whatever it took. Kind of went, right, Austin? We're we fought him to the end. And I can remember sitting in the trailer and saying to Austin, if we could just get Bernie out of our life, we'd be OK. <laughs> like, I want to enjoy a championship, but we have to be sick every day of our life that they're going to get us. And it was right down to the wire at the World Finals at Pomona. It was a really a good feeling, and I never said it to Bernie, but I'll say it now, that when you left the minor camp and you joined us, it was like, Coyle, if we could just hire all the crew chiefs, <laughs> we can beat us. We don't have to fear this no more. And Coyle said, but that's not what the game's all about. Bernie, towards the end of 1992, six months on the job with John Force, you told me if you were a wealthy man, you'd work here for nothing. 
Uh, well, I tell you, it's a, that's a, uh, why well, I would work for the force for free is a multifaceted question. He's, he's he continually surprises me. We see new things in him all the time. Uh, he does things that are absolutely wonderful as far as the relationships with people. He's very loyal. But I guess the, the thing that really amuses me most is just, just the off-the-wall deal. You just never know what, what's coming next. It's, it's an element of surprise. To some people in this sport, on the surface, you and Austin were like oil and water, but that has proven not to be the case. You're more like brothers now, attached to the hip. Well, in some respects, we, we are different, but we I think our differences uh, complement each other. We're, uh, uh, we both have inquiring minds. Uh, he's very technical, and, uh, and I tend to take a, a view of a little bigger picture. And uh, it's kind of an interesting combination. I'm not really sure why it works, but it definitely does, and we've become excellent friends. Speaking of Bernie, a lot of people thought, boy, that's the odd couple. Austin calling Bernie Federley. I give that about 24 hours. Not true. No, definitely not true. I uh, feel it was really fortunate for both of us. Whose idea was that, John's or yours? Oh, I think, you know, I think we've dis we had discussed the idea as much as a year before anything had happened. This program really works. You're talking about two opposite individuals, but yet very uh, unique that they did uh, merge together and make this make one good hot rod for us. And it really is a hard, a lot of teams have tried it. And it's, it's really strange. I've never really, uh, uh, never really figured out how, why they get along. I guess it's that intelligence wave of electricity that makes them, because I'm not, the only reason Coral puts up with me is because I write the checks. I've heard him say it when he left the room. Oh, don't worry, stupid will be gone in a while. I heard it, and I know. No matter how mad you get, and people don't understand it, because I'll have a fit, but when they put that lid down on the coffin, and you roll into that glue box, the only friends you have are right here. I'm going to be in this business. I couldn't be with better people. The knowledge that's around me right here, and the honesty, mainly. Because I've had crew chiefs that looked me in the face and said, everything's OK, and it was dead when it started. And you knew it. But that's the way some people play it. These individuals, and I learned from Coyle way back when we started 11 years ago, he was very honest about stuff. And he, when I would try to jive talk and the answer I wanted, he'd say to me, do you want the real answer or do you want, or do you want what you want to hear? Because I'll give it to you either way. But the truth was, he never did. He always told me the truth. And Bernie's the same way about stuff. I mean, it's kind of like when we went back a few years, we had the blower explosions. We had like seven in a row. And it's like, Coyle would tell me honestly, I don't know what's wrong with this thing. And it's going to blow up probably, probably when you hit the throttle, but we're going to figure it out sooner or later, like any test pilot, right? But what really aggravated me is to watch it. On the start line, Buster run and jump one fence, Coil runs and jumps the other. And you know, no, somebody give me a radio. I do not want to be out here alone. Bernie would not even get out of the truck. But that is when you say, no, 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 no. Somebody come get in the front seat of this car. I am not going by myself. So they worked it out and they gave me a radio where they could talk to me. And there's nothing better when you're just smoking it down there, you're about a thousand foot, and you hear Coil or Bernie on the radio say, well, them battles are in deep shit out there, boy. <laughs> there's tires all over you, and you don't see it, because it's going around behind you. This is the fifth race of the year, and for John Force, his fourth final round of Barrett. He's looking to make good on his promise to make 93 the comeback tour. I'm sorry, but I didn't know what was going on. Didn't know what was going on. What happened? Uh, he staged, went in, put it in, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. He was having a problem, obviously. Are we live? How's the air? Okay, shit. Hey, 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 are we live? <laughs> Last year, it was right here that Cruz Pedregon started to make his move on John Force in the points chase. John, dominant early this season, has slumped since Columbus. John Forrest has won the Jolly Rancher Northwest Nationals, his eighth national event. Those are science fiction numbers, John. Well, it is. It's a great feeling, but, you know, the drivers, like Cruz last year when he won five in a row, people just do the impossible, and we're just excited that our race car come out and do what it did, and, and I can 
go along with guys like Snake and Bernstein and just be part of the family and be part of funny car racing. Twice before, once in 1987 and again in 90, John Force has taken home the butt money here in the shootout. Given the incredible year he and his crew chiefs Austin Coyle and Bernie Federley are having, 93 could be the third time. John, what a drag race. America, beautiful. Only way a truck driver make 50 grand in a day. Huh? Can we do it? You won by three thousandths of a second. Well, did he leave on me? I... You betcha. You welded you. He welded me? Oh, damn, that kid's going to be okay be a world champ someday, probably. <laughs> Did we you don't care. Did you know you'd won? I didn't really know. I was calling on Bernie. I said, God damn, get, dang, get that radio working so I can hear you. And I seen the fingers from the boys, but it's close. He was right out the door. I drove her till her neck hung out by right in the last light. But <laughs> hey, we're happy. Castro's happy. Whack Chop, Dorman, all our people, Jolly Rancher Candy, and we got a bad Oldsmobile. John Force and Al Hoffman, one of these two great rivals, will race Kenji Okazaki in the finals of drag racing's biggest race, the U.S. Nationals. I told Coyle on the burnout backing up, I said, this thing is too gorilla. The sun come out a little bit. She's going to smoke the heaps. He's going to dance through here. They told we're going to need it for old Hoffman. Let me tell you something. 500 feet, she's hunting. He's out the window. 800 feet, that son of a gun's out the window. She trucked right into the light. I didn't know who won. I was yelling at Bernie. Talk to me. They wouldn't tell me. You know who you're racing the final? Japan. Kenji Okazaki's been shut off because of a fuel line leak. That means John Fors, after 20 years of trying, has a bye run into the winner's circle of the U.S. Nationals. But it's America, only in America, can you make 110 grand in one day in an Oldsmobile. Whack shop, Dorman, Castro GTX, all our people, Fram on Light, Mallory Crager, Goodyear. America. America. Fantastic, John. It is mathematically over. John Force with nine event wins coming into this final is the official Winston Buddy Car Champion. From here on in, John and crew can kick back and enjoy themselves. John, first you won the war, and now you've won the battle with a nice 5-10. You wanted a four, though, didn't you? Yeah, well, I'm going to enjoy this one. I'm going to enjoy a few drags. I might even take one off. What the heck? All weekend, John Force has been talking about being the second funny car driver in the fours and setting the national record. John, four seconds. Ah, God, we did it! Are you shitting me? I didn't even Good think again. it. I didn't, huh? Oh, I John. We did it. That's it. We did four. it. That's all that matters. I didn't even believe it. About a thousand foot, she started nosing over. I thought, what a hunk. It ain't going to happen. Coyle said, too much humidity, won't run. Forget it and settle. We did it. That's all that matters. We're late, but we did, we did it. We backed it up. New national record. Hey. All right. Let me tell you one other thing here. I love NHRA, and I love Winston, and I love pro, and I love this whole sport that gives me a chance, because a guy like me, if I can't express myself, I'm just dead. And I can come out here, and I can talk to y'all, and you just say, what a dumb bastard, stands up there and talks like that. <laughs> Comeback tour is what you got, and uh, next year, all I can say to the boys, and I'm leaving, is I can say, <clears throat> we're gonna be back, and the nightmare will continue. <laughs> I can remember one shot, first time, Kenny Bernstein, a good friend of mine. We were in Baton Rouge and it rained out on Sunday. We had to run it on Wednesday night. I remember thinking, can we have our check or just part of it? Because it kicked us out of the hotel. So while the great Chelsea pub, Kenny Bernstein, were resting up, getting ready, we were all sleeping in the crew cab because they put us out of the hotel because we couldn't pay our bill. And we didn't want to tell anybody. But we had our one shot to beat him. We ran the race on Wednesday. 
And final round, uh, we got beat, but it was it was something that you bragged about when you come home and went to the bar. Because you went to the bar because you got fed free and got a lot to drink free. Because they wanted to hear the story. But it was like, I got beat by the great Kenny Bernstein. And that was, uh, that was a real proud feeling. Following his first NHRA runner-up in 1979 at the Cajun Nationals, John Force appeared in the final round of eight more national events over the next eight years before drag racing's winningest Sunday car driver won his first big NHRA event. I was sitting one day with uh, a guy named uh, Goodwin. You know Goodwin. Sure, Robert. And Robert said to me, you know what's wrong with you? And I was really mad at him. I said, what? He said, you don't have the eye of the tiger. And I, I said, eye of the tiger? What is that? He said, you go out there and you race because you love it. But he says, right in the middle on burnout, you're handing out resumes to sponsors. You're talking. You're selling. You're not into your car like Joe Amato, like Don Perdomo. I said, what do you mean? He said, you've got to go in there with a vengeance. Like, that's what you live for. I said, yeah, but what you really live for is to keep the sponsor happy. And if he wants to ride on the spoiler, on the burnout, you let him ride. That's how you do it. And he says, no, you've reached a point in your career where you've got to step up and take over and prove you can win or you're never going to make it in this business. Your first national event win came in Canada. I'll never forget. It was a big race, and I'll never forget because Coyle said, he looked in the window and he said, something was going on. I was acting up. I was cutting up. I was being funny. Do you remember which one it was? Ed Dace McCullough. And I remember backing up and I said, Coyle, I've had so many black eyes and I've been in so many final rounds. And he says, backing up, you were all over the racetrack. I said, I was looking at the people in the stands and waving. He said, but we were trying to win. I said, I lost 14. I was called the bridesmaid of drag race. And as you know, you called me that. And I was backing up and I was laughing because I thought, I'm going to have some fun. I'm going to get beat again anyway. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And he said it was probably the best driving job. I left on the ace. I pedaled my car out in the middle and I won the race and I was in shock. Yeah, but wasn't that a truly a big deal when you proved to yourself that yes, you could win? Well, yeah, that's when the fear element went out of it. Still have the fear of fire, the fear of staying on top, but the old saying of making my hound dog dance. You know what I mean? One guy takes his hound dog with him in his hunting gun and he goes off hunting. Well, see me and my hot rod here, we go hunting. That's where the name hound dog comes from. Not just from an Elvis record, okay? But we have a day when we say, okay, baby, we got to go out and we got to win races and we're going to hunt the competition. We don't let them come after us, we go after them. And that's why when I talk about the front ends up, she's hunting, she's dancing. And when she wants to dance, she has magic. And the days she don't want to dance, she's just on fire. The motivation is to, in, the, in the beginning was to be able to be there because you were already starving, so you didn't know what it meant to eat. Y'all, you could always eat at mom's house, it was easy. I used to take the crew by and feed them on the way out of town and feed them on the way back. You know what I'm saying? But then it became the motivation to try to win. And win brought more money to give you a chance to win again next year. But now that you've won enough races to get back to what you really love, in other words, I don't have to win to survive, what really makes you want to strap yourself in a 6,000 horsepower, 300 mile an hour thing that wants to kill you? Because that's what it wants to do. You know, Don Perdome and Kenny Bernstein, if they have a fire, a blowover, they don't want to see the video. They never want to see it in their lifetime. You want a copy of it. Oh, no, that's what it's... Are you kidding me? Why wouldn't they want to see that? I don't know. They don't. I mean, I, I might not want to see myself having sex. That could be pitiful. But <laughs> on fire is... I mean, I used to get in front of the TV when they walked away, and I sat there and was like, no, oh, my fire was really better than Oh, man, Coyle, if you just would have... Just a little bit harder, you would have burnt that thing. Been, we could have led this show. And Coyle would say, you're nuts. But it's all over in your life. I have no death wish. Trust me. There's so much myth here that we're creating about being macho guys. I have the same fear. No fear on my helmet is a sponsor. It has nothing to do with me saying I have no fear. That's a bunch of jive talk. I have all the fear in the world. I have all the respect for this hot rod because it can hurt you. I got to tell you, they're as frightening to watch as they are to write in, maybe even more so sometimes. But you see the video and you go, God, I didn't know it was that bad. I've done that. I've honestly stood on the starting line. One of the neatest things that ever happened to me was at a race, I walked up behind Tom Hoover's car in one of the last sessions, and I walked up, and I wasn't even thinking about it because I'm so much into ETs and who's going to bump me or whatever, and I walked over to Hoover's car, and I looked in the window, and I looked at his eyes, and it flipped me out. I said, this is Tom Hoover, guy that runs a brake shop in Minnesota, and he's got this beard, and he's the neatest guy, but he is tied inside of this car. Somebody should let him out. It is, doesn't seem fair. And he's sitting in there, and he's looking up at his driver, and he's looking at his wife. Everything's okay. And all of a sudden, I got emotional. They can kill this guy. He's a puppy. They don't know he ain't a tiger. I, I start seeing the guy that I love. You know what I mean? Yeah, but and you do it all the time. I know it, but I don't see myself in there. And then all of a sudden, the tree was gone. I'm like, Whoo! 
it was gone. I'm like, where the hell is he? He was gone. And I walked away and I was sick at my stomach. I thought, the guy just tried to kill himself. That is what I do. Today could be one of John Force's most memorable, if he can get around Cruz. Here in the finals, he will not only regain the Winston points lead, but also pass Don Prudhomme as NHRA's winningest funny car driver. You weren't about to red light again. Not a chance. My old nerves, my old knees are knocking up there, Stevie, but... Oh, Cruiser's a good racer. I don't know what happened, but uh, he'll be the guy to win to, to beat to the championship. We're going to get there. It was almost 20 years ago that these two men brought drag racing to Australia. Today, John's looking for another NHRA win, while Gary is looking for his first. wins does that make this year? I've lost don't, count. Don't know. Don't count them. Every time I count them, I screw up. So uh, we're just going to take them as we come. We want that championship, and that's what we're going after. John Forrest comes here looking for his ninth national event win of the season for Cruz. The 92 champ, it would be only his second win of the year. Only thing I gotta say, Joe Gibbs, I've been waiting my whole life for you. Now I'm building money against you. Come on, because it's Super Bowl. Let's do it, buddy. Joe Gibbs, the new owner of the McDonald's team for 95. Coming into this, the first round of eliminations, John Force, the Winston title clinched, is focused on one thing, a new national elapsed time record. Good. Huh? Yeah. Good. It was hot, huh? It was a minute with field pumps. John, that may have been the run of your life. Fifty thousand dollars, a record in the '93, and the bonus points give you the championship. Well, the championship's what it's all about. It's why we came. We were even trying to concentrate on two runs and not smoke the tires, with Andy. But the championship's what we come after, and all the sponsors, Castle Jolly Rancher, all the people that did it, and my guys here that did it. They really did it. So. I love them to death, and God, I just got to figure out how to keep ball. Moments ago, John Force and Cruz Pedregon watched Kenny Bernstein set a new national speed record. That means this Pomona track should handle anything these fiberglass brutes have to offer. You got all the air in the world. You got the best racetrack. Bernstein laid it down. I saw what he could do. And my old heap she trucked. I want to, Steve, thanks. You know, Castle, Jolly Rancher, all the plugs, Wax Shop, Dorman, all the people. But mainly, I want to say to my crew, I love them to death. I'm trying to stay serious, my one shot tonight. My mama said to me, while she was telling me I was really full, that, you know, at the races at Pomona, she said, stop and smell the roses. Stop and see the people. And quit entertaining and try to be yourself once. That's all I'm trying to be. The road takes its toll, requiring compromise between family and career. For John, his four daughters and wife, Lori, it's all a matter of constant adjustment and keeping racing mementos out of the house. The other day he said, there's not even a picture of me in this house. There's a lot of pictures of him, but they're all family pictures. So to him, a picture of him is a racing picture. Well, somewhere along the road, you met a real pretty girl named Lori. Yeah, Lori teamed up with me. Geez, it, I knew her clear back in 75 when I started racing, but she went off to college and, and uh, really got away from the madness for a number of years. But she came back, and uh, we were later married. We have three girls now, uh, Ashley, Brittany, and Courtney, and naturally Adra from my first marriage. And uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a long, it's been a tough road, tough relationship. A lot of changes down the road, but uh, a lot of hard work by both of us. We both 
had to like just divide it. I'm kind of here with house and kids, and he's kind of on the road with the business. And um, we both enjoy what we do. I like my time when I come home to get away with them. We've got a place in Lake Tahoe that we go to, and we just get away. And of course, I've been known to stand in the surf in Maui with my cellular phone. And people laugh at me, say they can't believe it. But the job has got to be done. You know, it's, uh, I hate to say it, and, and everyone wants to project the perfect family life, but I don't believe any racers got it. You can't. You can't live in the bull ring and, and have the family in the bull ring with you. You just can't do it. It's been a few years since we've seen any bad crashes or fires or anything. So I don't think the younger ones remember it too well. I know Ashley has a few remembrances of uh, a Pomona crash. car was upside down and when she when we got there they were digging him out or digging the car out but she burst into tears and was convinced her dad was buried in there so I know that was pretty traumatic for her but she didn't know he was around he was already out and interviewing are you proud of what he's accomplished starting with nothing yes he really he really has done way beyond what I ever what I ever dreamed in fact when he used to race dreaming that he would just get to the other end and one piece in his car all together was, I, I never thought he would win a national event. That was just beyond what I could ever picture for him. Let alone five championships. No, never. John Force and Tom Hoover, two longtime friends meeting in their first final round together. Force after Pomona is looking to regain his championship stride with a win. John, you are a survivor today. Yeah, it was. It kind of brought it back to the old days. I think that's what I really loved about it, Steve, the excitement of, of me and Coyle and now Federally. We all looking at each other like we ain't the best, but we feel that we are, but things just weren't working. And it just showed you that old hot rod worked, and what the hell, we're in another winter circle, but it's a long ways to go. 505. Proud of it. It's John Force, 20-year veteran and winning his funny car driver ever in his second final round of the 95 season. His opponent, Dean Scusa, in his first ever career final. She ran good. We struggled all through the rounds. Clutch was coming out again. I didn't think she was going to make it, but we're okay. All day, the competition has been chasing John Force. So what else is new? And now, here in the finals, it's Cruz Pedregon's chance to unseat the jam. Of course, you're shooting at ducks or something here. A spark plug came right through the body. That's the wire. Shows you how good them uh, Autolite spark plugs are. They're just throw them out, just run on the other eight or seven. How many's it got? The first NHRA national event here on a difficult track requires driving finesse and tuning know-how. Well, who else but John Force in the finals against Casey Spurlock? It was like you had a target right in the middle of your forehead all day. They all wanted a shot. Hey, it's been all day, but they tell me the nightmare's over, but kiddies, it ain't. As long as you got Coyle and Bernie Federley and a Pontiac and Castrol and all them people that pay. Big duck on the block here, one. What can I say? Fram Autolite, we've done our job. They've been talking trash, and now they're meeting on the track. John Forrest, the Winston champ in the points lead again, and Al Hoffman, who has said repeatedly he's going to take away the title. Well, 
What happened, Al? Smoked the tires. No. You with lane choice. Al didn't want to dance today, huh? No. Yeah, well, we did, and uh, we're in for Sonoma. And to all the people support us, we know that game. We know who they are. They don't even care, but one guy they don't know about here is Steve Pluger. Built the finest race car chassis in the country, and about time somebody knows about it. And we won, and that's what counts. Hey, Force. Yeah. Who's the king? Dauber Dome. Never changes. Never did. I thought it was Elvis. Elvis, him too. <laughs> I feed you the straight line and you it. don't stand on it. I missed it. Can John Force win his sixth event of the year? Can Gary Densham claim his first national event win? We'll all know in a moment. John, for the second year in a row, you put away an old pal, Gary Densham. More points against Al Hoffman in the pack. He's a great guy that can be there without hardly any budget. Races against cars like Castro, and you know what I'm saying? I mean, Pontiac, it takes big bucks, and, and he's right there with us. But, hey, it was 200 victory for Castro from our teammates, for Gary Ornsby. That's what it's all about. Now, me and Densham, we're just going to go have us a cold beer. For John Forrest, 1995 has been a great year. He's had consistent runs, no major problems, and the points lead. Elvis at a thousand feet, but it lit up. Terrible to waste a motor like that and not even be exciting, Steve, but uh, <laughs> we're kind of pushing it tonight. Tonight to run low ET. We saw Cruz run that 13, and we just tried to push the number. Something went wrong down there. It burned a piston on the first run, but it's exciting. Got Rusty Wallace and all the big NASCAR boys on the start line. We give him a little show. Well, it's all over but the shouting for John Force. A win here in the semifinals will clinch for him a record fifth Winston title and secure his place as one of Funny Car's greatest drivers. This thing went from a poodle to a pit bull, buddy. You got lane choice and everything. What's your on? Oh, wait. Oh, wait, uh, I want to say that was kind of, that was the race I wanted because, you know, for Castle and Pontiac, Jolly Rancher, we want to prove a point. After all the suspicion all year long, it's over. We could win five championships. It was over before that, but I just wanted to beat the man. He's a great racer. Western Auto's a great sponsor, but we did what we want to do. My old boy stepped up. I'm f***ing proud of him. And cut out that last part. Sorry. Do it again. God, you Hey, John. Can't you cut that? They said, here's the rules. You ready for this? Can't drink, can't cuss. That ruined me right there. And you can't smoke. Now somebody explain that to me. You know, we won our fifth championship and right in the middle of wanting to sit down and say, wow, I finally did it. Bernstein, I want to let you know, clarified it that him and Perdome won four in a row and I only won three. Okay, no, something's going on here. <laughs> <laughs> Have you told him not to laugh? <laughs> well, can I go back to swearing? Okay, I'm okay, let's thank my sponsors. Here they are in this car. Can we do that? What I really want to do is take a minute here to thank, uh, thank my people. Austin Coyle, Bernie Federley, all the guys on this team that made it happen. Uh, they worked real hard. Without Coyle and Bernie, it's impossible. How they work together, it's unbelievable, but they gave me a winning car. He was a, he was a good kid, but he played it everything. Everything was fun. To John. Now, when he was in uh, working in the foster freeze, he goes, see how big he can get them cones up there, you know? <laughs> you ought to see, he'd be standing there at the window, and everybody's standing around taking, watching him, you know, what's this guy doing, you know? I think clear back when I was a kid, I was telling stories somewhere in a, in a Taco Bell or a McDonald's trying to get a free lunch, and I never had a race car that would really run, but all my cars looked like race cars. They had Mickey Thompson mags and big slicks and four-cylinder motors, and it wouldn't go nowhere but I gave the impression. So I was really in the theater, even as a kid. And when I started out racing, I was on the street corner. I mean, I handed out balloons as a clown. I can remember in Montreal, because a girl didn't show up that was a Wendy's girl, and for an extra 25 bucks, they gave me her suit and pants, and I put on her wig 
True story. Stood on a street corner and told him, don't worry, John Force will be here in a minute. No one knew who I was anyway, so it didn't matter. You know what I'm saying? I can be a minister. I can be a rock star. I can be anybody I want to be. And that's what's really neat about the love that I have. And yeah, I guess you could say theater or maybe the rock image. That's why I bought the big bus, because we want to travel around. We want to go to shopping malls and meet the people. We're a national events where you have to race and you have to stay focused. At a match race, you can get loose. And that's for the theater because the people have come to be entertained. And I can, I can open my podium in the back door and I can be Jimmy Swaggered. I can tell stories. I can tell lies. I tell anything I want. As long as I tell them, a, 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 I'm using sure. not lies with Jimmy Swaggered, but or I can be Elvis Presley. I can sing hound dog tunes out the back. I can do anything I want to do. I can give away t-shirts or I can sell them. But it's my podium. It's my show. What racers did you learn from, either promotion or business or savvy of some kind? Who were you really watching? Well, you really had to, to watch Tom the Mongoose McKinnon yep. because he was slick. He was a guy that was very much, there was three groups that I learned from. One was McEwen in the beginning that knew how to hustle and keep everybody happy and how to make money from it. Then there was Don Perdome who strictly stuck with the race and, and sponsors just came because he was dedicated, that's all he lived. And then there was a Kenny Bernstein, the corporate Bernstein, that knew how to go to companies and get money. And I really learned from the three of those. And I got educations from all of them. One, uh, Tom McEwen taught me my first. We went to a final round at a match, at a, at, a, at a PDA race at Orange County. This was in the early days. And McEwen walked over to me in the staging lanes and, he, and I never even knew. He had a big afro, McEwen did. And he said, Force, I've got a problem. Uh, we burnt the rear main out of the car. I'm not going to be able to do a burnout. I just want to stage and get my money. So do your thing. And I went back down and I said, can you believe this? Mongoose has told me it's over and we have won our first major race. And I was really excited about it. So I went out, did a burnout all the way to the lights, backed up, and he rolls in the glue and he does a burnout. And I thought, wow, what's he doing? This is where the education comes in. And he backed up and then he laid low ET of the event on me. And I got out the other end. I said, I ran out of gas. What happened to you? And he said, first lesson, kid, don't believe nobody. He said, even the ones that you look up to. And I thought, well, that was an education. When was the first time you realized <clears throat> Don Perdome knows who I am? The first time? I'll tell you the first time he didn't know who I was, when he said, kid, don't bother me. And he flapped me on the chest. <laughs> and I said, whoa, what is this? He, my guy said, he ran you off. I said, no, he spoke to me. They said, no, he wasn't <laughs> speaking to you. He was telling you to get out of the way, chump. When you look at Don Perdome, he has the eye of the tiger. Perdome, even when I called him out of retirement to come back in a funny car, he laughed at me. And he said, I'm gonna whip you just like I used to. And he wasn't joking. He was stone serious about it. My whole life I dreamed of this deal here. I love Kenny Bernstein. I wanna see Perdome beat him because I wanna beat the snake in the final. And if I don't get him, I'll take Bernstein. But I really wanna beat Don Perdome. He's my hero. feel about this one it's a big one for you well um, I'm trying to stay calm and relax and it's been a while since I've been in the final as you know and and uh, the bud shootout it, it's big money but there's more than that here it's it's my big showdown with the snake uh, all these years I've waited to get him in a final I just never got a shot and with him going to top fuel this just may be my last chance Steve and Kenny Bernstein in the final. I'll take that race any day. Great job. Hometown L.A. Love this. Who got lane choice? He does. Don't care. Don't matter. Still here making money. Trying to stay calm here, Steve. John Forrest has been telling us for a long time about a dream he has regularly about beating Kenny Bernstein in a final round. It's happened, John. 537, John Force is the finals champion. My home. 
Hometown crowd. They're I can hear them cheering for me. What you run? 537. It doesn't matter. Oh, crazy old Austin Coyle. Oh, terrible shite down Austin Coyle. That old team. I've never seen such a thrashing fighting going on between. <laughs> To set here and Bernstein be the champ, I told Coyle, you know what it means? If we can just come out here and whip this guy. Whip the best. Whip the best, okay? Him or Snake. We talked about it earlier, right? Well, Don Garlitz once said he never had air conditioning in his truck because he wanted to arrive at the track angry. That's right. And, and I mean, I mean all time, and that's the way they were. And you know what? It's really funny. I, my hair stands up when you make statements like that. Like one time I'm at Irwindale Raceway, and they said, Shirley Muldowney's coming over the bridge. Evans was announcing, best announcer in the world right here. Coming, and this is the stuff that motivates you, that someday they will say my name. You know what I'm saying? But you know what's You, know what's you really can see funny? the freeway from the tower. Yes. Right? He said, she's coming over the mountain, and like, she's serious. And the whole deal was based on the fact there is, they threw the alcohol out of the trailer. In other words, they're going to run straight cans, straight nitro. Right. And it was the way that you talk. Or Raymond Beadle making an entrance at a race where he ran from roof to roof from car tops, got out of his helicopter that he came in on and jumped from roof to roof. Now, this is the magic as a kid. You know, it's really funny, Henry, coming in here is all the years when I was growing up around race cars that to go into a shop, Keith Black's or, or yours or around, they always had all the, the nostalgia, all the cars from the past, Cheryl Greer, I mean, guys, the Swamp Pratt, yeah. Don Gartlett, mm -hmm. your cars, yeah. Jim Dunn. You know what's really neat is when I won five championships, and that's a good feeling, but when I walked in the other day when I come to talk to you about this video, to walk in and see my picture on the wall, I kind of felt like I really joined the elite. I really thank you for well, that. Well, thank you. Now, you've always needed a carrot out there, okay? Something you could chase, be it that red car of Kenny Bernstein and along came Cruz Pedregon. If you don't have that carrot, you get real frustrated. The real truth is, what is the motivation? You want to call it the fear, but it's, it's, it's the fear of the unknown. Of, am I going to win today? Am you're, I going to... You're curious about the unknown. Oh, yeah. Are, are, are you going to win? Are you going to be the champ? Are you going to be beat by a completely unknown rookie that no one's heard of? The worst guy in the world you can race is a guy you've never heard of. You know what I mean? And because he'll, he'll whip you because he's got nothing to lose. But yet you're in that cockpit, and the unknown is out there for five seconds. Quill took me to a topless bar one night. Can I say this? Sure. Your video. Took me to a topless bar. And this girl comes out on stage, and she is dressed in a tiger suit with a big old tail, and it is spectacular. But when she took the suit off, it was over. Now, Coyle, he was into it big time. <laughs> but me, I wasn't. I just sat there and looked, and I thought, boy, they ruined that. No more mystery. And he said, what is wrong with you? You took away the unknown. And the race car is the unknown. Every time, you never know what it's going to do. You don't know if it's going to blow the body off. You don't know if it's going to run in the fours. But you go down that alley, and it's all there. So all that motivation, all that stuff is there, just like that lady before she took her clothes off. My most fun year was losing to Cruz. Think about it. There is more motivation as a coach that when you've won the game and you jump out of the huddle, you know, you've won it, and it's over. What do you do now? But, boy, let me tell you something. When you get out of your race car and it's dead, they drag your baby back to the pits, and it's cooked to the ground. You know you're out 100,000 or more, and you walk in that trailer. Now you can talk some talk. And, buddy, let me tell you, they listen. Bernie's looking at you. Coyle's looking at you. The crew's all standing there. Everybody's in shock, and they're waiting for you to say that you quit. I was always best when I was down. John Force is on a roll. A win here against Hoffman will put him into his third straight final round of the season and help John maintain the points lead for his third straight Winston Championship. After one of the most incredible crashes we've seen in a long time, John Forrest is on his feet. Bitching, huh? Is this live? <laughs> when you're on fire, you're ready to fight. You're ready to stand up and say, hey, 
it's time to go. Good coffee here today. Give me some more coffee. But like, it's ready to start the battle. For the first time in a season and a half, John Force is not first in the points. That honor belongs to Cruz Pedregon. If Force hopes to win the Winston Championship number three, he needs to get around Cruz here. John. Yes, have I lost? Topeka on fire, blew the body off. Best interviews in the whole world. My interviews bore, bore me now. I'm getting boring. Evan's trying to pull an interview out of me. Topeka, it was a real, but I lost. I mean, all time, there's no car left, right? This time last year, the championship was John Forces. This year, though, the fire boots on the other foot. Cruz has the points lead, and Force has to push himself and his machine if he's going to catch Pedragon. Well, they're telling me now, Brock, when they first arrived on the scene, that he was unconscious. Uh, obviously, he shot the motor off and got the parachutes out, and then apparently from the shot he took against the wall and maybe the emotional drain of seeing the championship probably slip away, John just took a little nap. He's going to be okay. He's a strong, tough competitor. We left Dallas. It knocked me out. Evan's there. I'm tongue sticking out you of my mouth. You faked that. I'll believe that to the day I, I, I never died. faked it. You think I did? Yeah. I peed on myself. I did. Now, you don't fake peeing. When you pass out, you pee on yourself. The only person who has not yet crowned Cruz Pedragon World Champion is this man, John Force, currently qualified on the bubble for this, the last race of the year. Dome down here, as are a lot of racers concerned about their friend and all of our friends for that matter, John Force. He is okay. John, you all right? I'm great. Where are my kids? Okay, buddy. Yeah. I saw you in the TV screen. Locked up the brakes to come and help you. We got a lot of shit to do. We got to put another car on. Simple deal. Barrel valve stuck wide open. Car smoked the tires, couldn't get off it. Good to help from safety. Safari Ryan Davis is right there and all their guys. And uh, this damn thing ain't over yet, but I'm starting to wonder about it. Then at Pomona, she goes out our one last shot at Cruz, and, and Coyle said to me, interview all you want, but the truth is, Cruz had already locked up the championship. You're just too stupid. I'm starting to get plenty pissed, and we're not down yet on this damn title. She flipped over on her lid. She's sliding down the racetrack upside down, and I'm thinking, this is spectacular. I have stole all the ink. I have got all the TV. Cruz is the champ, and they won't even talk to him. There have been rumors around that you might get a uh, sponsorship for life deal from Castro, kind of like Richard Petty did with STP. That's because they know I'll have a short life. We know that. My doctor says I got a heart like a racehorse, but he said I'm class A. He said any day I'm gonna do, just seize up and go. But that's how I want it to be. Coyle promised me no matter what goes wrong, and he even told Bernie, and Bernie said, Coyle, that's, that's really kind of rude that you would make a statement. He said that's the way Force wants it. So I asked my guys later, what were they talking about? Cole said, if we're in the final round and four steps over, shove him in the seat and take him to the start line. We'll send him. John Force is a lot of things. Drag racing's winningest funny car driver, a gypsy rock and roll flopper pilot, a prince of a guy, a clown, a big fan of Elvis and Richard Petty. John Force is a lot of things. Portable, fan favorite, a competitor's nightmare, upside down and on fire. John Force is a lot of things. But most of all, he's still the one. People that just come off with something that they see, not something you try to create, but it's got to be for real. And I remember, uh, you know, we had the brute force and, 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 and names like that over the years. But the real slogans came uh, when you win a championship and then you lose it. And someone said, man, you got to come back. Well, it become the comeback tour. Or you won a championship, and then you won again. It become back to back. You know, back to back to back. I lost that championship, and I had to buy all those shirts back. 
That was a loser, thanks to Cruz. But all those slogans are created. And then I had a guy walk by me one day, and he said, hey, man, you are their worst nightmare. And the nightmare started. And then we won again, and it became the nightmare continued. And that's where they all come from. And our new Logan that we're going into next year, in fact, the, the name that, that I wanted to put toward the movie was Still the One. It's an old song. We're still the one. Da, da, da. Still, terrible, huh? Awesome. See, notice why I ain't a singer? Want the best seat in the house for the hottest motorsports action? Then choose from over 40 spectacular titles in the Diamond P Motorsports Action Catalog. 